Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us today for this special webinar series. We're going to be covering environmental monitoring, flood warning system telemetry. We'll be focusing on uh, different telemetry options. I'll walk through some advantages and disadvantages of all the different options. And then um, have a uh, summary of all the different options that you can you can utilize going forward. My name is Charles Jos. I will be moderating the webinar today. We have uh, three great speakers that we'll get to shortly and introduce them. Before we get started, just a note, uh, we will be recording this webinar. So if you want to reference this after the fact or share it with someone who was not able to attend, uh, we will record this and uh, just reach out to us if you would like a, a link to that recording. Because we are recording it, we're going to go ahead and mute everyone. So everyone is uh, locked in and, and muted. Um, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to ask those questions. Uh, we have a couple different ways um, that you can do that. We can uh, You can send and submit your questions through the uh, aptly named questions box there. Someone will either respond back to your question directly and, um, and through the text box, or we'll ask it or work it in throughout the, throughout the webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will um, allow people to unmute themselves and uh, they can ask their question directly if we have uh, time remaining at the end. Also, if you come up with a question after the fact or you don't feel comfortable submitting questions through either of those channels, um, what we have contact information up here at the bottom left there. Feel free to reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions um, as well as provide any information about anything that you see here today. And with that, we'll get started. So we're gonna introduce our speakers here. Uh, we have a great slate of speakers uh, combined. They have uh, about 80 years of experience uh, in the hydrology space. Up first is Gary Baker. He's our HydroMet manager, covers uh, for the hydrology segment for FTS, High Sierra, and One Rain. Um, he's been in the hydrology market for about 25 years now, over 25 years, um, and has a great wealth of information. He'll be, he'll be uh, doing our introduction as well as focusing on our satellite options today. After Gary, we'll, uh, we'll have James Logan. Um, James is the uh, CEO of both OneRain and High Sierra Electronics. Uh, he has uh, close to 30 years of experience in the environmental monitoring space, and uh, he has been with, with OneRain for about 16 years now. He uh, has led designs uh, for telemetry and software um, around the world and he'll be spoke, focusing on uh, radio-based telemetry options. And then finally, we have up uh, Tom Ogden. He's our senior product manager for High Sierra. He has uh, been with High Sierra since 1993, as well as been in the flood warning space uh, since the early 80s. And uh, Tom has a great wealth of information uh, for the hydrology space and designing flood warning and um, hydrology networks. And he will be focusing on our on our IoT at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will pass it over to Gary, who will lead us through an introduction and go through our, our our agenda. Gary, are you on? I I am on. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for all those that are joining us. I see a lot of people here that I've known for many years. Thanks for being with us. Today, in terms of our agenda, we're going to cover um, different options for telemetry. Leading into that, we're gonna talk about monitoring systems and define what your system may look like, and then again, focus on the, on the monitoring or telemetry side of that. We're gonna look at requirements as you're considering different types of, of equipment or different types of uh, methodology of telemetry we, we should probably consider a number of different um, requirements uh, while making those decisions. We'll talk about the telemetry options and then do some summary in the end. 
by and large, the things that we're going to, the, the three different categories of telemetry that we're going to talk about are terrestrial radios. Um, James is going to talk about those. We'll talk about satellite solutions as well. Uh, we'll talk about three different satellite solutions as well as the Internet of Things, which is kind of a newer buzzword. It's a newer technology, in some cases, lower cost. We'll talk about some of the trade offs um, with with IoT as well. So looking forward, if we consider um, some of our different requirements for our site, it, it's been interesting I, as we've talked about this, all of those on the panel, all of us over the years have been asked this type of question a number of times and that is people might call up or ask you um, when you're visiting with them, well, what's the best type of telemetry to use and, and the the answer to that generally is there's there's a best per site and a best per network depending on what you're trying to accomplish and so with that in mind we've we've come up with a few of these questions to ask yourself or a few requirements that you might consider one is is there an existing network that i already have established and if so, how big is that? And, and do I want to add to that network or do I want to create something in addition to that? Do I need my data to be real time? And we can talk about some of that as we go forward. How often do I need to, re, um, to measure my sensor, um, report my data, transmit it? How much data do I need to send? Is it small packets of data or is it something much larger? What is my budget for my installation and equipment? What's the budget for ongoing data as we continue to uh, send it in? Do, do I need that to be free of cost or do I, you know, can, can I afford to have um, to pay for that data? What type of coverage do I have for telemetry? Um, in other words, is it a hard site to get out of or is it relatively easy? Um, is it mission critical data? Do I absolutely need to make sure that my transmission happens when I expect it to happen? And then last, but certainly not least, this, this comes up all the time and that is what are my power requirements and what, is, what, what kind of power can I get in there? In most cases, it will be battery and a solar panel. So that being said, we also put together a grid that, that we're gonna show also in the end populated after we've talked about these. You'll see in our top row at the top there, we, we have the different types of telemetry that we're going to cover and talk about in detail. And then the column over to the left um, are some different, uh, the, the different things that, or the categories that we're going to populate with under those, um, the different telemetry options. As we talk about a monitoring system, we created this diagram as well, just, just spelling this out from, from the beginning to the end. Um, sensing, it just depends on the type of site that we're looking at. Is it a weather station? If it's a weather station, those parameters and those sensors might be different than simply a, a stream flow site um, or a flood site. Um, then, then we consider, do we want to log the data? And um, if so, then that will determine what kind of um, telemetry or logger we have out there. And then do we want to transmit the data? And that's, of course, what this webinar will be about, is transmitting uh, telemetry. And that will determine as well, in a lot of cases, of how we'll receive the data do we already have a base station software out there? And what is it? And, and is that adequate as well and satisfactory to meet our needs? Um, and then of course the data content and the decisions that we make and, and what, how are we gonna process that data? But again, by and large today, we're gonna talk about the telemetry options. That being said, we're going to start talking about the terrestrial uh, radio options and start that with, with James Logan. Hello, everybody. Um, so 
we're going to um, talk about terrestrial radio options. There's uh, three three types that that we'll discuss. Um, alert two, um, which is a um, the latest generation of alert technology. So we'll focus on what alert two does. Um, and that's a that's a technology that's been in use in the in the U.S. for a long time and has been supported by the National Weather Service. We'll talk about Modbus, which is a protocol that can be done over radio that is used by some agencies, and it's a um, it's the technology that's typically called SCADA, which is um, used primarily in industrial applications for doing in industrial and process control type things, but it's it's used as a telemetry for um, for a few agencies in the U.S. that we work with. And then um, packet radio networks, which is a, another technology that um, allows you to communicate more um, as if all the sites are part of a um, of an Ethernet network. That's sort of how, how it behaves. They're, they're, they're essentially all on a network. So starting with Alert 2, it's it's widely used across the U.S. Um, for for real time applications and primarily for flood warning and hydrology applications. It can be used for other things, but for the most part in the U.S., this is probably the um, you know the 99 percent of its use is for um, is for flood warning and hydrology applications. Um, it was designed to be backward compatible with Alert, which Alert has been in place since the um, early 1980s, and it's um, an, an older technology that needed to be replaced. And Alert 2 was designed to be both backward compatible and to provide all the modern conveniences of a modern telemetry platform. Um, it's an open standard. It's being managed by the National Hydrologic Warning Council, and it's been um, supported by the National Weather Service. Almost every agency in the U.S. that has an Alert 2 network forwards all their data to the weather service to be part of their um, forecasting and warning process that they do in addition to the local agency using it for their own purposes. It's real time um, and real time in this in the alert two context means that the data gets there between 30 seconds and two minutes after it gets after a data value gets recorded and that time delay is is typically related to how many gauges or uh, sites you have on your network. So if your network has has 200 sites, then there'll be lo longer latency. And if your site, if your network has 20 sites, then the, um, the latency can get very small, maybe even down to five second latency. Um, it's a two-way protocol, and it also supports encryption, so you can do secure things with it. This is um, these are some features that have been added to the protocol recently, and they're now supported by the vendors. And so now you can can use these capabilities for um, for both two-way and encryption. Um, it's it's a low power protocol, so the the stations, almost all the stations that are out there are solar powered. Not all of them are, but the majority of them are. It transmits small data packets. So it's not a good protocol for transmitting large content. Like it's not a good protocol for transmitting camera images, but it is a good protocol for, for transmitting environmental data, um, rain gauge data, stream gauge data, that, that type of data. And it's um, it's used, Alert2 is primarily used on radio networks, but it is also supported over IP networks. So there are actually money vendors out there that have built um, interfaces so that they can send the data, for example, over a cellular um, data network. They can send Alert 2 content that way, and it can be sent through other means also. So Alert 2, um, it's primarily for measuring precipitation, water levels, and weather stations. That's what it's mainly used for. Um, it's best um, when you have a, a line of sight system. So it's good for regional applications or local solutions, but it's not good if you like, if you have to build a national network of things, it's not good for that. But it's good if you're part of a, a city or a county where you can, um, where all of your stuff is regionally located, and you can um, build a um, radio path between all the sites and where you want to collect the data. And um, it, it typically has infrastructure investment. So when you have a like a site that goes across a county, for example, they'll um, you need to pay to have. Um, repeaters put in locations to bring the data out. The um, 
you know, one of the big advantages of Alert 2 is that the system is it's very reliable. So once you build the system during extreme events, there's no dependency on any outside resources. So so this is a, a big strength of this technology is that if you have a, a um, an operations center that that deals with or emergency operations center and you want the system to work, it'll always work even if the internet goes down. If uh, um, if the cell network goes down, if the you know if a hurricane's pounding and the streets are flooded, this these systems work when in, in those extreme events, and you're not dependent on the internet being available or anything else. So it's a really um, robust technology for dealing with emergency applications. So, and um, when you build the networks, if they're built properly, then they're built they'll be built with no single points of failure. So if they're designed properly. And implemented properly, then um, they, that's part of the robustness of the system. Um, Modbus is a is another technology that's being used. We we have a few of our clients that use it for their um, radio networks, and it's um, it's it's used. The, the protocol itself is used pretty widely. It's used both from sensors talking to a logger and from loggers actually transmitting over radio networks. Um, the, the way that we've seen it implemented primarily is a pulled solution. So there'll be a central computer controlling um, an RTU that, that basically sends polling commands to all the sites in sequence and says, give me your data, site one, give me your data, site two, and it brings the data in. Um, the agencies that we work with that, that use it primarily are creating time series data out of it. And the um, the time series the time interval is pretty dependent on how many gauges are on the network, you know. So, for example, to um, to have 15 or five minute data, you'd have to make sure that you could pull all your sites within five minutes. So it's it's fairly complicated. But I we have a few agencies that you, that have like 500 sites. That, or one agency we're working with has 500 sites that are using Modbus and they're pulling all the sites to produce 15 minute data. But it requires them to have three different radio frequencies, and um, you know, it's it's sort of a, and they're they're actually starting to get full with the number of sites that they can pull because of the uh, the the slots are filling up to su support the 15 minute time steps. So um, Modbus is uh, it, it's primarily a system where you measure sensor values, and it's it it's similar to the other systems that it's a um, it requires line of sight radio. So they typically implement it with sort of a hub and spoke architecture where all the sites are are um, around the spoke uh, spokes, and there's a hub that sort of does the polling. The um, the need for line of sight is a is one of the major issues with um, with the, with a uh, radio-based system like this because you have to make sure that you can communicate from site to wherever you're collecting the data. Um, Modbus is not, um, from a radio protocol point of view, it's not a very secure thing. So there, so um, it, it, with a Modbus network, any um, any of the entry points are its weakest links. And when you, do, when you use radio protocol, basically every site is, a, um, is an entry point and so is the the central um, polling master that's that's pulling the data in. That um, packet radio is a is another protocol that is being used by a few agencies, and it's it, it, when it has a lot of good things about it, and some some things that are that are not as good about it. So the um, it gives you the capabilities of, of a full network on it. So you can basically do anything you can do over Ethernet network, you can do over a packet radio network. The um, It's typically more expensive because the hardware is more expensive that goes at all the locations. It can be complicated to implement. So um, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's just because the, the network, it doesn't necessarily have a hub and spoke network. It's basically the sites can communicate with each other and they can act as repeaters for the data uh, and route the data throughout the network. Um, it, it is a real-time um, system. So the latency on a, on a packet radio network is, is pretty minimal compared to some of the other protocols because you don't have to wait as long for the data to get through. Um, it does support two-way because it's um, basically it supports everything you can do over an IP network. Um, it is higher power because the radio is on all the time. 
So because radio has to be listening and transmitting all the time in a packet radio network. Um, and it can su support both small and large data content. So you can use small data, but you can also pass images and other things because of the way the um, packet radio works. And, the, um, and it's pretty flexible on how you can lay it out on a network. So it can fo follow along a long river or it can be um, central with like a hub and spoke. So it can, it, it can, be, it can work several different ways. So now I'll hand it over to Gary to talk about some of the satellite options. Thanks, James. The three different satellite options we're going to talk about is first GOES, and then we'll talk about Iridium as well as Inmarsat, otherwise known in some cases as Orbcom. First, we're going to talk about GOES. I just threw a quick diagram here together to, to, to talk about the, the, the path of where it begins and then where you receive your data. Of course, the, the bottom left is an indication of your gauge site out in the field. And it transmits from there up to the GO satellite. From there, it's gonna bounce either down to Wallops Island where the data is first received or it can be received over at Sioux Falls. If you receive it at Sioux Falls or if it's received there, then you can easily capture it from from their site, either from uh, from the uh, um, their their website, um, or like the USGS pulls it off into their um, endless system from there, or it, it bounces up from Wallops. It can go to the Domsat satellite, and from there you can have your your own local readout ground station that you can capture your data. But it's very quick. And capturing that data, it's extremely reliable. Um, I did lay out, I grabbed this, this uh, image as well, just giving you an indication of where exactly from the GOES West and the GOES East satellite in terms of coverage. You can tell from these two satellites, great coverage with North and um, Central and South America, as well as some of the other a um, little bit in some of the other countries, but some of the other countries also have their own satellite systems that work similarly off GOES. For instance, in India, they have INSAT, and it uses roughly the same transmitter. It's just certified different than a few other tweaks, but that, that gives you a similar GOES access to some other parts of the world as well. Just a little bit of background how GOES works. In some cases, some, many on here probably have used GOES, there are some that have not. So just wanted to cover in, in briefly, and I have a picture here of a, of a current GOES transmitter data logger, the LT1 that, that um, we make at FTS. Um, you, you would get your data or your access to a GOES transmitter um, an approval through NESDIS. NESDIS, by the way, is a, is a division of NOAA. NESDIS stands for National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Services. They actually manage the, the satellite systems. You apply for your access to it. From there, they'll give you a channel and an ID. The, the DCP or the, the ghost transmitter actually stores data um, in the buffer, and then when you're, you're given a time slot by NESDIS, and when your time slot comes up, it will transmit the data that was stored in the buffer. For instance, many are given an hour window these days, um, and if you're logging your data every 15 minutes, those 15 minute readings would be stored in the buffer, and then when your hour comes up, it would transmit those for measurements. That's done in the self-time channel. You can also be given access to a random channel, and the random channel is basically an event channel, <clears throat> meaning that you can set it up saying that if my stage gets to X value, then transmit. And, and so you can do that. And in some cases, there are many that are using that for alert type sites as well, not alert in the way that the the actual acronym and alert, but, but more of a, of a warning type site. We move on to the next slide. 
Um, I, I just threw this up here to touch briefly. Um, setting up a ghost transmitter is by and large, when, when, when NESDIS gives you your access IDs, they'll, they'll give you your ID, your channel, your baud rate, your transmission rate, and your window. Um, and you just put those right into your data logger, your ghost transmitter. So all of those just have these boxes or these places where you put that information that they've given you and you put it right into the transmitter itself making it really quite simple. A couple of advantages and disadvantages for GOES. GOES, there's certainly the probably the biggest advantage is it's, it's free to use. For those that, that are using it, there is not an annual cost or anything like that to, to use the GOES satellite. So when, once you're granted access and given a channel and ID, um, it's, it's free to use. It's extremely robust. It's been around for years and um, proven and established. So um, the advantage again is the random channel as well. So if someone wants to wants to be able to transmit based on events, they can. Disadvantage that the equipment compared to some of the other telemetry options that we're talking about perhaps has a has a bigger upfront cost. But again, it's it's free to use. The other disadvantages, it's one way. I put up here access to, to using the GOES, but by and large, most people have can 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 get access and we can help advise you how to get that as well. I just threw up a couple of pictures here of some GOES sites. Um, you can see the Aggie antenna on a number of these. Um, that is a more traditional GOES antenna, and I got a picture on the next slide that I, I want to show you as well. But one of the pictures as well on here, I threw this up here, it's a little bit of an older, the, the second one to the, to the right, a little bit of an older unit that FTS that, that, we, that we made. But what I like about this picture is that um, a lot of people who don't use GOES for systems such as groundwater or something of that nature, but FTS helped a group up in Canada do a large um, program and network of groundwater sites where they used GOES, and this is a picture of one of them. So it shows the flexibility of, of different sites. I like this site as well. This picture was sent to me by the USGS out of Truckee. Um, you'll see that that picture on the left, they actually have both of these antennas up there. They're hard to see, covered in snow, but the Aggie antenna, obviously, at the top, and then right below the solar panel, you'll see the Eon GOES antenna that's made by FTS. Um, the Aggie quit transmitting. It quit transmitting through that, that Aggie with all that snow, and the Eon continued to transmit. As far as our next telemetry, we want to talk about Iridium um, briefly here, but Iridium is a more commercial type satellite. GOES is, is managed by the government. Iridium is, is a commercial satellite or satellites rather. There are 66 low orbiting satellites. They, they orbit at 476 miles from the earth. They're going at eight kilometers per second. They can, they, they clear the earth or cover the earth in nine, roughly 90 minutes. So they are whizzing past up there. When you transmit, you're gonna transmit up to the satellite and it's gonna basically find the closest one at that, at that given time. The message occurs latency is, is roughly 20 seconds. It's, it's less than that. Global coverage, the coverage is fantastic. When you have 66 satellites up there, um, you can get, you can transmit data from uh, about anywhere. You do get access to two-way communication, which is a, um, a nice advantage as well. Disadvantages here is you pay what you use. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more here in just a second. I like this diagram. This, this shows a couple of different types of telemetry sites down here at the lower left, shooting up to the Iridium satellite. And then it comes through your gateway at the bottom. 
And the gateway by and large determines how much you're going to pay and so forth, and who's going to who's going to help provide you with the data. So the two different satellites at the top are kind of an indication that these satellites are moving past you, and when you transmit, it'll hit the satellite that's above you at that time. <clears throat> Some of the advantages and disadvantages of iridium. Again, in some cases, um, I threw up here the DOD gateway, which, which represents Department of Defense. And if you have access to the, to the Department of Defense gateway, um, transmitting through that can be free um, in, in a lot of cases. Um, Iridium is extremely robust and reliable. It's a great network proven and under um, some cases it's two-way communication, which is great for, um, again, for satellite. The disadvantage is cost. The cost is quite expensive. If, if, if you're not getting um, a free access to it, it can be expensive. So you, if, if you want the two-way communications and you want the, all the advantages of Iridium, it does cost a bit. So the other satellite solution that that we can provide at AEM is Inmarsat, Inmarsat, or otherwise known as Orbcom. And, and we've done a number of sites. I've got some pictures up here in just a moment. It is geostationary, so it's, it's, it's not the low orbiting. Um, it's up 22 plus thousand miles from the Earth. And so it's actually rotating with the Earth, um, which, if you lock in your beam when you install it and it locks in, you're not going to miss a transmission. It, it, once you've locked into that satellite, um, unless something is tweaked at the site, um, you won't miss your transmission. It is also another pay as you use. And so um, it's not a free service, but again, it's, it's all about what you want and what your needs are. This just gives you an indication here through this map up of, of really the coverage. The coverage is great unless you're on the tips of, of the earth. And I don't think anyone on this call is. So we've, in terms of, our, of, of what we're looking for in this group, you'd have great coverage. Immersat is extremely uh, robust, um, not prone to you know, having storms, get in the way of its transmissions. Network is established. Again, your, your um, latency is not an issue. It's, it's 20 seconds if less, if not less. Geostationary as we talked about, which, which makes it extremely reliable as well. Disadvantages, again, you pay as you go. So you, you um, pay for the data as you use it. So you want to use more data, it's going to cost you more money. So here's a, um, four pictures of some of our satellite installations that we've done. And I like the way we've titled this, it's mission critical for remote, for remote locations. You can see these sites are certainly out in the middle of nowhere, but they don't miss transmissions. They, um, they work very well. For, for these users that are trying to get their data on the regular. So um, great, great installations and, and great locations. We'll turn the time over to Tom. Thanks, Gary. Uh, so as we see, I'm gonna be talking about the internet of things and I'm sure everybody has been hearing this term uh, a lot these days. Um, uh, again, obviously like the internet is a, a fairly new, uh, uh, technology compared to these others that we're that we're speaking about. Um, a lot of what we hear about, a lot of the protocols, uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, Zigbee, uh, six low pan. These are these are more uh, local areas, uh, sometimes referred to as personal area networks. Um, you know, smart homes and things like that. Uh, what we're more interested in, you know, covering larger areas would be. Um, uh, LP WAN, so uh, low power wide area networks, and uh, cellular uh, certainly fits into that category. We're going to look at a, a 
mainly uh, uh, one of the one of the LP WAN uh, technologies, LoRa WAN, and um, yeah, we see on on the right here a typical um, uh, network where you've got uh, uh, nodes transmitting to a gateway that's transmitting up to the cloud, and that's that's not untypical for a for a IoT type network. So cellular has um, uh, we're going to look at advantages and disadvantages here, like we have been with the other technologies, and and one of them is kind of demonstrated by the the uh, map on the right. I believe this is a, a Verizon coverage map, and and while not every inch of the country is covered, uh, certainly the vast uh, majority of it is, uh, and and some of the areas that aren't covered there are covered by uh, other cell services. So. Um, uh, that demonstrates it's a there's significant infrastructure in place already. So there's a, a nationwide backbone of, of communication that's uh, installed and maintained by others. So that's, that's one of the things you're paying for. You're you're not having to put in your own uh, infrastructure network. Um, there's uh, yeah the, the capability of transmitting uh, large messages. So this would be like video you're not going to be doing with with most of these other technologies uh, or, or even images but uh, cellular it's it's basically unlimited and, and of course you you're going to pay for it but uh, uh, you do have that capacity if that's your need then then that could be a good solution for you uh, it is also the the potential to cover large areas with a dispersed network of gauges so um, Earlier, we were talking about, uh, James was talking about alert technology, which is, is great for a, a city, county, or, or region uh, where you might have a number of, of repeaters bringing the data into a central location. But uh, if you have sites that are spread out tremendously, 20, 30 miles, and, and not a dense network, uh, it, it doesn't really work in, a, in an alert type environment or, or a SCADA type environment. Uh, but cellular, given that wide um, network capability, uh, it, it would be a good solution there. Uh, it's very power efficient when you're transmitting in a in a one-way mode. We we have sites that uh, are, are normally uh, sleep or in low power mode, and uh, when it's time to take a, a reading, power up, transmit a signal, and go back to sleep, and that's that's very power efficient. Um, and, and as we um, I think I mentioned that it's also a, a two-way communication is is available just like uh, it's like cell phone communications. You're you've got the two-way communications. If you've got a video, for example, you could be issuing pan to tilt zoom uh, commands uh, back to the camera and have it have it uh, be responding basically in real time. Uh, some of the downsides, uh, like other commercial solutions, uh, you've got the recurring cost. Uh, there's also a signal fade during uh, heavy rainfall events. And, uh, you know, we're talking about hydrology data here. Is that most of the, some of the most important data you're looking for are, are during high rainfall events. So, so that could be a problem. If you've got marginal signal normally, you could be losing data in, uh, during storms. Uh, we mentioned the two-way communication. If if you are doing two-way, uh, you're powered up all the time. Uh, definitely heavier power consumption there, uh, larger panel, more battery, etc. Uh, they're also uh, typically in emergencies, which is you know perhaps the time when you most need your data. There's a heavy network usage uh, on the the cell networks, and and that could uh, affect your your uh, data reliability. But we've also, I'm, I'm out here in Northern California, and um, you've probably heard about the PGE power outages we've had here last year and expecting again this summer, and, and that affected uh, cell performance. So uh, we had uh, some cell towers were actually down uh, with the loss of, of uh, AC, and uh, some were that were running on generators had, had lower power, lower signal powers. I had that at my house, and definitely less performance uh, uh, 
uh, when they were running on generators. So those are some of the things to consider with cellular. Uh, a couple of examples, of, I'm gonna give you two examples. Both of them are, are hybrid solutions where we're using uh, two different uh, uh, telemetry uh, modes. And this is a, a state on the East Coast where they're a cooperator with the USGS in a, in a large network of, of uh, water level sites that the GS uh, maintains for them. And uh, what they wanted uh, redundant data and they also wanted more frequent data. So uh, in this middle picture here, you see uh, our data logger with this uh, Sierra wireless cell modem in there. And uh, we're reading the the uh, SDI-12. Basically, we're in something called a listen-only mode, where the the uh, GOES DCP is is reading the uh, the bubbler here. And as as uh, any reading comes across, they're doing five-minute readings now uh, to get that more frequent data. We're we're uh, uh, listening in on that, picking it up, and transmitting. So they're getting five-minute data. So so uh, just a, an example of how you might uh, blend uh, telemetry solutions. The next one here is a uh, another hybrid solution. Uh, you see on the uh, the map to the right here, you, all these yellow dots actually represent uh, at least three locations. So this is a um, in Texas. We're out in the hill country outside of San Antonio, and we're using a VHF, so terrestrial. Uh, radio uh, alert communications between the the uh, the gauging sites and, and triggering these uh, flooded roadway warning sites uh, up the road in each direction and uh, locally we're using alert communications but as you can see in the map uh, we've got uh, back to their base station and this is hill country back to the base station is is 80 miles from some of these sites so uh, what we're doing here is uh, each of these subsystems includes a cellular gateway. So the data is coming into the cloud, into uh, one rain's contrail for uh, display, alarming, and historical data, and, uh, and also gives them the capability of communicating out to the sites. So here's an example where we're using the robust uh, 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 alert communication locally, and um, and tying into the base station with, with cell. So that, that gives us that dispersal of, of uh, communication. And uh, so now we're gonna look at um, LP WANs. So um, LP WAN again is a low power uh, wide area network. And some of the, uh, some of the protocols is uh, LoRaWAN, which is a long range wide area network. Sigfox, which I believe uh, was was the first of, of these back in the early 2000s, and, and then there there are some uh, 5G cellular protocols that are being developed. You know, most of the cellular data that's being sent is more like IP uh, data. They're actually developing these small packets of data, similar to these other protocols that will be utilizing the 5G uh, networks. So uh, again, there obviously, as the name implies, it's uh, long range uh, in, in urban environments, uh, maybe a few kilometers, but uh, over 10 kilometers in, in rural settings. And it really depends on its uh, line of sight base. So depending on, uh, could, can go significantly longer than that if you've got a, a significant elevation on your receive side or, or transmit site and, and no obstacles. Uh, low power, there, there's some of these um, uh, transceivers can, can run on small batteries for up to 20 years. So it's really designed to be uh, low power and low cost as well. So the, the LP wins, uh, the simplified uh, lightweight protocol reduces the complexity in the hardware design. And, and so it ends up in lower device costs. And uh, it's uh, also, uh, cheaper for the infrastructure there. There's um, some of the infrastructure. Well, let's go on. We're going to talk about LoRaWAN. I think we've got a, yeah, where we've got, uh, so gateways. Uh, the, first off, there's a LoRaWAN. There's a, it's an open protocol that is, uh, there's an international alliance, the uh, LoRaWAN Alliance 
kind of oversees the protocol and and it's a network of uh, uh, providers and device developers. The uh, there are some public networks being installed, so they it's somewhat like a, a cell network in that uh, the, the gateways are are out there by installed by a third party, and you're just in, installing gauge sites, or you might be installing a, a private network um, where where you're installing your own networks and uh, and that way, um, yeah, well, just that they're public and private networks. Uh, trans transmission distance, as I said, it could be up to and over 50 miles if you have true line of sight. Uh, again, it's low power. Uh, it's, it uses an adaptive transmission rate uh, based on, on the connection. So it, it uh, communicates with the gateway and gets a confirmation acknowledgement back, and it can uh, determine at what rate of transmission the, it's using a, a chirp spread spectrum technology, and it can spread out how um, how wide those uh, chirps are spread out. And the, the more it spreads it, the the um, uh, greater sensitivity at the receive end. So um, it determines the signal strength required to get the message through, and then uses that ongoing. So that this diagram shows a uh, uh, various types of end nodes or, or sensors and transmitters uh, transmitting through a gateway that then goes through uh, a network server and the network server uh, performs security checks it uh, filters duplicate messages uh, basically manages the network and then uh, forwards data to uh, application uh, servers so uh, in our case it would be uh, uh, contrail by one rain i've got an example coming up on the next slide here, that would be um, uh, using what we're, we're transmitting through a, through a private gateway into the Things Network, which is the, the network server. Uh, but this is a, uh, we're calling it REMS, it's a remote erosion monitoring system. On the left here in that cabinet up on the pole, we see uh, the gateway is installed and it's uh, a levee erosion uh, detection. So we're the intent is to detect in near real time levee erosion. On the right hand side, we see a beacon that's uh, about three inches in diameter and uh, about a foot tall. Those are installed in, uh, in a levee, and there would be a fairly large density of beacons implanted in stretches of the levee that are at risk for, uh, for um, erosion. Uh, erosion occurs. The beacon starts floating and transmitting every 10 sig uh, seconds a, an ID signal that goes through the network, gets to Contrail, and we know exactly where that uh, that beacon was buried, the GPS location and depth. So that information is immediately sent out to uh, key personnel, and uh, and then strategically based on on the um, <clears throat> uh, path availability, we would be placing gateways in proximity to these, these uh, erosion sites so that we're uh, ensured that we're gonna pick up the signals. And then the, uh, as we said, the gateway uh, passes the signal on and it, it's, it's um, very, very quick and, and the, the alarms go out. So that is a, an IoT solution that's kind of our, our first, uh, entry into IOTs and now I think Gary's going to get back to uh, looking at that chart and, and summarizing these options. Thanks Tom, thanks James. I did get a, a question on and I just want to retrieve this I suppose now and clean it up. I did get a question on Iridium costing or cost of Iridium to to, uh, to receive your data. Um, I I suppose I made the uh, the statement that it's free. It's Iridium is, is really not free unless you have access to the to the Department of Defense gateway, which is really used by the Army and so forth. If you're working with the Corps of Engineers, for instance, they have access to it. Um, other than that, it's it's it, 
it, it's really you pay as you go and you pay for the data that you use. If you'd like to discuss further, much like a lot of the things that we spoke about, we spoke about a lot of telemetry options today and a lot of information. We realize that in a lot of cases, um, not, not everyone will have retained all this information. If you'd like to talk about any particular site and your best options for those, we would love to chat with you about that. So um, at AEM, with all of these options, we can provide and, and, and consult with you and try to find out the best one for you. If we go back to this, to this chart, let me just briefly talk about this, and we, we can also help you get one of these as well. But again, um, the top row are the uh, telemetry options that we spoke about, and the left-hand column, some different um, things to consider when, when putting out a gauge. For instance, do you want real time? And again, based on the things we talked about, we've populated in there what is real time and what is not real time um, and how we've how we've defined that and, um, and then we put equipment cost and then data cost for instance you see alert and SCADA is at no cost the, the goes is at no cost um, but then you see so, such as the cell and, and iridium and some of these others they have costs associated with them some of it varies and that's why we put from zero to a number because it varies how much data you're going to transmit how often you're going to transmit so again we, we could consult with, with any of you if you like over some of these um, power requirements for instance we put dependent on some of those some of them we just know are lower or higher than others based on what they come out of the factory at. Some of it's dependent, again, on how often you transmit and how many sensors and so forth are, are connected to all of this. So some of it does vary, but the nature of some of these uh, telemetry options are lower power versus higher power, and that's, that's what we're trying to focus on here. So based on some of this, you, you can see a summary. We'd love to, to chat through any of these. If anyone would like um, some help or some consulting through this, we'd, we'd love to help with that. So um, with that, we're going to turn it back over to Charles. All right. Thank you, Gary. We're going to open it up for questions. Uh, we had some, some good conversations here. We, we certainly covered a lot of telemetry options. Um, so there, there might need to be some clarifying questions or if people have any follow-up questions, feel free to ask us. Again, just to reiterate what, what Gary said, um, we, we did cover a lot and there, there is a lot within that summary slides. Um, and kind of to echo what he, what he said in the very beginning, each site and each need is unique. It depends on the agency, what they're trying to do. Um, and so uh, we would love to help you walk through some of these uh, challenges and um, and to, uh, to to help you find the, the best solution that works for you um, regardless of um, of where it fits on that spectrum and on that table so I have up here before we we open it up um, any questions feel free to reach out to us we have some general contact information here up at the top including a, a general distribution group and some general phone numbers as well as the speakers uh, email addresses feel free to uh, to reach out to them, tell them how much uh, you enjoyed them speaking or to, uh, to ask a question. With that, I will uh, peruse through here through the questions. It doesn't look like we have any any follow-up questions. Uh, we do have just one, one clarifying, just to echo what, what Gary said. Um, it, it looks like that DOD gateway may or may not be uh, going away towards the end of this year. Um, so that 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 free mechanism may or may not be there anymore. So we we can we can help walk through that if, if uh, Iridium is is of interest. And uh, with that, I will. If there's any follow-up questions, I will allow people to um, to unmute themselves. And feel free to to unmute yourself if you have any questions. And 